Yes, good morning. It's, it's great to be here, um, especially good morning to all of those jet-lagged in the room. Uh, I very much appreciate it that you're, that you're here. Um, so what I would like to do uh, over the next 15 minutes is to give a bit of a perspective of what we do or rather don't know um, about the past and more future evolution of sea ice, both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. Um, and since I realized that, um, surprisingly, not everybody in this room thinks that sea ice is the most fascinating thing in the world, um, I, I thought I'd uh, have a talk that uh, also has perspectives for, for all the other things that we're looking in at here. Um, so it'll be a bit of a generic um, talk. And just to get started, um, just three, three pictures of how the Arctic used to look like, how it looks like today, and how it will look like possibly in the future. Um, so this is the Arctic Ocean in uh, summer 1979. It's the first year um, for which we, where the continuous satellite record started. And you see that in this year, um, in the beginning of the satellite record, in some of the entire Arctic Ocean was covered by sea ice. And then over the next decades, that uh, sea ice got smaller and smaller. Um, so this is a snapshot from September 2007, eight years ago. Um, and so over the past three decades, we've roughly lost half the area of Arctic sea ice and the ice has also roughly thinned by 50%. Um, so if you think at uh, early, early morning, but the math isn't too complicated if you halve the area and you halve the thickness. It turns out that over the past 30 years, we've lost roughly three quarters of Arctic sea ice volume in summer. And if you say that we've lost three quarters of Arctic sea ice volume in summer over the past three decades, um, then it seems to be only a question of time until the Arctic looks like that in summer, um, an Arctic Ocean with barely any sea ice on it. And for some reason, people want to know when this happens. Um, and it's a classical problem of decayed predictability um, because it's not impossible that those two X's up there um, are, is a number that is on a decayed time scale. And so if you want to know when something happens in, in the climate system, there's one thing to do, of course. You take the IPCC report, you open it, you look at it, and you get the answer. And here's the answer. Um, so if you took, um, take the RCP 8.5, CMA5 CS simulations, uh, and we say that Arctic sea ice is roughly gone when summer sea ice area drops below one million square kilometer. We can just look what models are saying, and the models are giving us the definite answer that um, in RCP 8.5, Arctic summer sea ice will be gone at some point between 2005 and 2130, which is a very precise period. But for some reason, neither the public, nor politicians, nor scientists are very happy with this answer, and they try to narrow down this uncertainty range. Um, and the first thing I would like to do throughout um, much of my talk now is actually to look at this question, why is it so hard to narrow down um, the period as to when Arctic sea ice is gone? Um, and then in the second part, I will briefly touch upon some possible ways, ways forward. So why is it hard to figure out when sea ice is gone? Because there's a very standard method to figure out which of these models is good. Uh, we can just compare model simulations to observations. So this is the observational record um, of Arctic sea ice evolution in summer. Uh, we can take one model um, shown in blue here, which is a bad model, of, obviously, because if you calculate a trend, it's a slight positive trend. Uh, we can take another model, uh, which has a clear negative trend, which is much better. Uh, we can say model two is obviously much better than model one. Now, the problem is, as also, for example, Ed Hawkins pointed out yesterday, um, it's the same model. Um, so model one and model two is both our Max Planck Institute Earth System model, um, and simply internal decadal variability um, makes this model simulate in one simulation an increase in Arctic sea ice over the past 30 years and in another simulation um, uh, evolution of Arctic sea ice that is similar to what has been observed. So it's very hard to say which of these models is worse because it's the same model. And for some, sometimes um, I think we are all drawn to, to believe models more that agree with observations by some, some metric. Um, and so in order to clarify maybe um, in a bit more detail as to why this might be misleading, um, because I'm a, I'm a very simple person sometimes, so I, I took a die, a six-sided die, and I said, let's assume that the real sea ice trend is a six, which is just definition. And then I worked hard and produced a die, mod die model, um, and I let it run three times, so it's a three ensemble uh, member here. I got a one and a three and a five. Um, and I worked harder and harder because the mean didn't look right, so I produced another dye model which gave me a six, a five, and a seven. And then I ran all my metrics over these uh, results, and I figured out that this model is a bad model of a dice, and this is a really good model because the mean agrees perfectly well 
with reality. And so maybe the first take-home model, which uh, take-home message, which I would believe is obvious, but sometimes it maybe isn't. Um, the model that best agrees with observations is not necessarily the best model. And to, to emphasize this point one more, um, once more, what I've done here is to just look at the trends calculated from all the CME5 models over the past 30 years. Um, so this is the trend in Arctic sea ice area in million square kilometers per decade. And each dot is a 30-year trend. And I synthetically increased the ensemble size a bit by shifting the start and end dates um, by five years forward and backward relative to the satellite period um, to capture a bit more of the internal variability. And so what you see here is that, that the models have a huge spread in the trend over the past 30 years. Decadal variability just makes basically any trend possible, not quite, but there's a huge uncertainty in what the real trend, um, how the real trend should have looked like. And so just looking at, at plots like that where you see how large the internal variability of trends is, um, it's quite straightforward to come to another very obvious conclusion. Metrics with large decadal variability are not helpful in evaluating free model simulations, I should have said, on decadal timescales. And another thing that's sometimes overlooked is also the fact, well, people say, well, it's a 30-year trend, and 30-year captures climate somehow. Um, so there's this notion that if you do something over 30 years, um, internal variability is kind of gone. But the problem really is that at the moment we are in a state of very rapidly changing background state. And whenever that is the case, um, 30 years often are not enough to rule out internal variability. So another thing we could then do um, is to look at more specific metrics to figure out which of these models is good or bad. Uh, one is shown here. It's uh, a histogram of Arctic summer sea ice concentration. So basically, if you just look at the right-hand bar here, um, the right-hand bar just shows how much of the sea ice in summer in a certain model um, is above 90% concentration in a model grid cell. So there's 90%, more than 90% um, open, uh, ice and less than 10% open water. And some models have many grid cells with that high concentration ice, which are shown in red here. And some models um, have very little of this very high concentration ice in summer, which are shown in blue here. Um, and if you look at these models, you, you'll figure out quickly, well, it's a, that's a really good metric. Because half the models show the ice should be compact. It should have lots of high concentration sea ice in summer. Whereas the other half of the model says, no, no, that's wrong. Uh, high, sea ice in summer is relatively low concentration on average. Um, so you can throw out half of those models by just comparing those models to observations. Um, and we have different observational records from satellite. Um, uh, one is shown here, and that's the bootstrap uh, algorithm. Uh, one is shown here, that's the NASA team algorithm. So these two um, final panels here, that's observational records. Um, and we don't know which of these is wrong, which is right. Um, so these are the observed CS concentration in summer. These are the models one. And this observational uncertainty that we don't really know the CS concentration in summer has huge implications for um, predictions. Um, here's just an example for a seasonal prediction. So what we did there, uh, we used our seasonal forecast system in this case. Uh, we initialized it in May, um, so everything was um, spun up. And the only difference between two simulations we did here was either using the NASA team CS concentration record or the bootstrap um, CS concentration record. Um, and then we left the model alone in May with these two different CS concentration data sets, and we let it run for four months. And this then shows the difference in September um, sea surface temperature between these two simulations. Um, so three months after we had left the models alone, um, in the Arctic they show a three Kelvin difference in sea surface temperature simply because of the uncertainty in CS concentration uh, that we put into the models in May. And so another obvious take-home message, um, observations are not the truth, um, even though they're surprisingly often treated as such. Um, observational uncertainty can actually be surprisingly large, which again makes it very, very hard to figure out what happens in reality because observations are not reality either. Now there are metrics um, where observations are um, possibly stable or robust, and if we combine it with reanalysis, here's one example. Um, so the mean thickness of March sea ice, which we here got from uh, the observation of area divided by the, uh, the where we took the reanalyzed sea ice volume and divided it by sea ice area. And that gives us a metric that many models um, fail to match. Um, so again, we can say, oh, these are obviously bad models, so we should throw them out if we look at the future evolution of sea ice. Um, some models agree super well with this metric. Um, the problem with this metric 
um, ex that some model use this metric to tune for. Um, so some of this agreement of some of those models is simply because the models aim to match the, just this particular metric. It's not that this model is particularly good. It just randomly happened that some of these models use March CS thickness as their tuning uh, parameter, um, while many other models don't do that. And so another one, um, model tuning really can mask missing physical realism. Um, and I think it's, it's really crucial, especially for the next um, CMIP-6 activities, but also for decadal prediction studies, um, how models were tuned so that we can understand which of these metrics we didn't match by chance, but simply because we, we tuned for them. And then uh, if we look at uh, decadal predictions, um, the one thing that we are all, always interested in is, of course, the memory of the system. Um, and we tried to figure out in a study that uh, Stefan Tietze um, did when he was doing his PhD in our group, uh, where we looked at um, the memory of that is in the Arctic system that is controlled by sea ice itself. Um, so this is the sea ice evolution in, uh, that was still CMIP uh, 3 um, in the A1B scenario. And we just wanted to see how large is the memory of sea ice in such a um, simulation. And so what we did was to remove all sea ice um, in 1980 and then remove again in 2000, remove it again in 2020. And we were expecting if we remove all sea ice, the ice will remain gone forever because the ice albedo feedback is very strong and we can make perfect decadal predictions. Now here's what happened. We removed the ice in 1980, so we forced the model to have no ice anymore. Uh, and then after two or three years, the ice was just back where it wanted to be. Um, and that is because negative feedbacks, especially in winter, um, where outgoing long wave radiation increases, where thin ice grows very quickly, um, simply reset the memory of Arctic sea ice very, very quickly, um, which obviously is a shame if you want to do um, decadal forecasts. And so negative feedbacks make it hard to beat um, persistent forecasts um, if those negative feedbacks sort of reset your memory again and again. So these were some of the issues we face when we try to understand how sea ice might evolve in the future. Um, but not all hope is lost, um, I hope. <laughs> um, there are certain things we can do um, to figure out when Arctic sea ice might be gone. Um, and one thing um, that is um, getting more and more attention are those uh, immersion constraints, for example. Um, so those are shown here from a study um, 2009. Um, where Bo et al. looked at the trend over the past, whatever, 30 years or so, and then look how much ice is actually remaining um, over this 20-year period here. And they find a relationship between those two, and then you can just look what the real trend was, and you get an estimate um, of what the future might look like. Now, one issue with these kind of um, estimates is, of course, that there are issues with them as well. I don't go into detail about them. Um, but that, that for these forecasts to be robust, it's really important that the models um, don't all give the same simulations. And so a bit of uh, model diversity is really crucial for getting these immersion constraints. And so it's sometimes a bit worrying if you look at the huge list of CMIP5, CMIP6 models, and you then go into detail and in looking at the individual components, um, that sometimes I think we have a false sense of how much diversity there really is in our climate model zoo, um, since individual components are often there are only two or three around that basically everybody in the world is, is using. But to me, the, the probably most promising way forward um, really is to understand things. Um, and I haven't talked much about Antarctic sea ice yet. Um, so Antarctic sea ice, as I guess we all know, is very slightly increasing over the past decades. Um, some people say that it's a significant increase. Um, I do have some issues with this term significance because it assumes all sorts of Gaussian unrelated distributions if people do these kind of studies. So let's just say it's increasing. Um, and models don't capture this increase. But if you look at the time series here, um, that's from our CMIP, um, five simulations. Well, there are periods where Antarctic CS is increasing. There are periods where Antarctic CS is decreasing. Um, maybe um, this is shown even better here, um, which is a, a cumulative density function. We just did 100, uh, 100 member ensemble with the fully coupled MPIES MLR. And this just shows um, how much percentage has a trend that is smaller than a certain number. So the observed um, trend over the past decades in winter um, is around here. And around 20% um, of our models show an even larger increase of our simulations. 80% show a smaller increase. Um, and that was basically the message I had in the beginning. Uh, we can't really tell much about model quality just by looking at trends. And so the thing we really need to do in order to understand if a model is good or not is to understand 
um, processes to understand why a model differs from, from observations. And so if we look into more detail, um, especially in the Antarctic, it's important to look at regional patterns. Uh, we see that in the observations, we do have this large increase um, here in the Ross Sea, Amundsen Sea, uh, which we don't really see in our model simulations. So something clearly is wrong. Even if we match the overall evolution okay, um, the regional patterns don't match at all. And if we look into further detail and we look at the surface pressure patterns, it turns out that in reality, or at least in the reanalysis, um, the surface pressure in this um, region here decreased quite strongly over the past decades. And so we got more offshore winds here, and these offshore winds just blew the ice out over the ocean. Um, and we didn't get this in other regions. And so because we do have this um, um, asymmetry here, we do get an overall net, net increase. Whereas in our simulation, everything is super zonally symmetric. And so clearly the sea ice difference that we have uh, between model and reality are to a large degree um, driven by um, the fact that we don't get the surface pressure right in our model. And this then allows us to fix things, to make things better, um, to get improved sea ice evolution in our model. And so um, to, to come to the end, um, I think ways forward, uh, model convergence is not necessarily desirable um, since it might mask emergent constraints. Um, the other really important thing is that understand and evaluate processes and metrics really will help us to, um, to make pro progress. And um, a lot of the studies that, that we are seeing are just diagnostic um, and they don't really understand or help us understanding things. A third thing maybe um, that I think will be helpful is to simply appreciate the fact that we can't answer certain questions precisely. And we shouldn't make the impression to the public that we can tell them when Arctic sea ice is gone. And once we are honest and open about that, it really takes a lot of pressure from us. And now people think, oh, everything we do must be super policy relevant, and I don't think that. Not all our science must be directly policy relevant. I think curiosity is really nothing to be ashamed of. And I think we can be a bit more proactive about um, getting that across, possibly also to funding agency, even though I appreciate that that will be very hard. Okay, so conclusions. The observational record is only one realization of an infinite number of possible trajectories. And hence agreement of a simulation with observations does not necessarily mean that that simulation is particularly good. Model evaluation and improvement, in my opinion, is most robustly achieved through understanding, for example, understanding of key processes. So I'm not even sure if we always need new model studies. We should really aim at understanding the ones that we have. And finally, I think communication and interaction between modelers and observationists is key for success. And that is fostered, for example, by this workshop, which I'm really, really helpful, uh, grateful for um, having us all here. And I'm very grateful to the organizers. And thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you. A question. So, um, thanks for an interesting talk. Um, I definitely agree with your third point there that uh, we need to understand the processes much better. But just on the kind of constraint issue, I, I wondered if anybody's just done a simple constraint where you look at the amount of ice that we have now because it, it looks to me like the ones that have the most ice take longest to, to melt it. So, so has anybody tried that? Yes, there are a couple of studies, um, for example, by Francois Massonet, who looked in more detail as to um, if you have very little ice now, um, and in reality and in the model, um, it's more likely that that model will capture the real evolution, because some models just have absolutely excessive amounts of sea ice, and they will not get it right what happens in the future. I think the, the thing that I just want to warn against is that doesn't say anything about the quality of the model. Um, it just says that maybe those models will help us more to understand how the future will look like. But I, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah. So perhaps I should just say something a bit briefly about the IPCC assessment of sea ice extent, Arctic September sea ice extent. The, the, the sub-selection of the models was based both on the trends and on the Massonet study, on the mean amount of ice and on the seasonal cycle. And it took a huge amount of discussion amongst the various sea ice groups in different chapters to come to this um, um, point at which we could sub-select uh, some, some of the CMIT-5 models in order to make our assessment of projections. And to, to me, this was, this was for, for me, 
what one of the triumphs of my time in the IPCC that we managed to get one projection variable in the whole report uh, where we subselected the, um, um, the models. So um, uh, I think it's right to be critical of that, but I think we also need to think how we can do that for other uh, variables too. Do you want, do you want to respond to that uh, quickly? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I think uh, maybe we, we can take that up in the discussion section. Um, I, it's just personally, I'm, I'm not a very big fan of sub-selecting um, models because I, I really think we don't understand well enough why they differ. Um, it's one thing to use emotion constraints and say this is a robust physical relationship between one metric and another, but to say these models are good and those are bad, um, I do have some issues with that. Um, but we, I, I'd be very happy to discuss that further in, in detail. Okay, yeah. so I think Thank you.